Good morning. Welcome back to International Intercultural Education Virtual Programming at Metropolitan Community College. My name is Barbara Velasquez, and I'm thankful you are here and hopeful that you will continue to join virtual programming throughout MCC's winter quarter. National Disability Employment Awareness Month's 2021 national theme was America's Recovery Powered by Inclusion. It emphasizes the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have full access to employment and community involvement during the national recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed by President George H.W. Bush in 1990. As a result of this landmark legislation, cities and workplaces across the nation have become more inclusive and welcoming for America's nearly 40 million people with disabilities. Exploring disability history reminds us that anyone, regardless of age, race, or heritage, may become a part of the population of people with disabilities at any time. Today, we will watch a documentary and then have the pleasure of discussion with our filmmakers. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Please send your questions at any time to moderator Velasquez via chat. I will share your questions with the filmmakers after the viewing. Also, watch for a link for an online evaluation of today's program posted in the chat. Oscar-nominated filmmakers Stephen Asher and Jean Jordan are the founders of West City Films, whose projects include Sundance Grand Prize winner Troublesome Creek, HBO's Emmy-nominated Raising Renee, and So Much Fast, which premiered at Sundance. Asher is the best-selling author of The Filmmaker's Handbook and was a visiting professor at Harvard. Jordan served as series producer on the Emmy-nominated children's series, Postcards from Buster, and edited two episodes of the groundbreaking civil rights series, Eyes on the Prize. Their newest film, Our Towns, premiered on HBO in 2021. Please welcome Stephen Asher and Jean Jordan, who will introduce Raising Renee. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm Steve Asher, and Jeannie uh, Jordan is my wife and film partner. And we made this film about 10 years ago, and Jeannie will tell you a little bit about how we, how we got into it. Um, <clears throat> the way this started is in 2003, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2003, I had a fellowship at Radcliffe to edit a film we were working on. And my the person next to me in a studio, a painter, was named Beverly McKeever. And over the course of our time to get next door to each other, we found out a lot about each other. And she told me about a promise she had made to her mother that she would take care of her um, mentally disabled older sister if her mother died. Her mother was quite young, so this wasn't Anyway, we we filmed Bev's first big opening in New York and remained friends and things. And then everything changed because her mother uh, died of pan pancreatic cancer and her sister Renee moved in with her. And we're basically, this is a chronicle of what happened in the next several years. So it's a really interesting film to look at in terms of disability things because Renee is intellectually disabled, but her, she's actually capable of doing a lot of things and not everybody in her life, including her mother, necessarily recognize that. So that you'll see in the film that she kind of comes into her own and um, I think that's a really interesting thing to look at uh, on a dis on, in terms of a disability program. So um, let's look at the film and we'll be back after. Thank you very much um, for being with this audience. This is your opportunity to uh, send in your questions. So moderator Barbara Velasquez, please. And we're gonna get things started here. Welcoming back Stephen Asher and Jean Jordan, Jeannie Jordan, um, our filmmakers. Uh, we're gonna let our audience 
um, evaluate everything, but I just can't, I just have to say what a beautiful documentary. <laughs> I'm not wanting to, uh, you know, give them thoughts there, but uh, I'd, I'd like to start with, what message did you want to get? There's so, it's so multi-layered. Like, what were you hoping when you created this documentary? Um, well, first I want to say that um, I haven't seen the film in I really uh, several years Many at years. least, <laughs> and so I just watched it, which uh, so I'm sort of up. <laughs> but I I I I'm very proud of the film, and we did not know what to expect about it, and we really felt like what we wanted to do was chronicle what was going to happen to Beverly and Renee, whatever that was. And we were lucky enough that we were filming people that had no guile with us. They did not put anything on. They were absolutely themselves always. So you get the truth yeah. of the situation. I think one of the things we really wanted to, I mean, so our mission is kind of to be as intimate as possible with our subjects and really get what their life is about. But I, as we were editing the film, you know, one of the things that was really important to us was to kind of go against the cliches of what it means to sacrifice yourself for somebody else or be a caregiver that Beverly is sharing with you both what the great joys of taking care of Renee and the great difficulties. And she's very honest about both of those things. And sometimes people are afraid to show that stuff in public because they think it makes them look less heroic or something. And we felt it, she was more heroic because she really stepped up in a situation where she had no intention of playing this role and she's done it for Renee, she's doing it for her dad now, who's 90, what, how old is he? I, I he, don't he's, know. He's, he's over 90, but I the think. dad that she never met until she was 16 years old, she is now taking care of. And, you know, we just have so much admiration for that. Also, um, I just personally want to say we were just talking, Bev is, could also be a stand-up comic. She is a very, very, very funny woman and so much fun to be with. Um, so we all actually had a very good time while we were making the film. Thank you so much. Um, I will say that I take a lot of notes when the documentaries are on and I, I was struck immediately by her humor. Um, it was... <laughs> I think it probably makes her a great um, teacher mm -hmm. uh, because she's she uses humor, but she also uses um, this deep emotional connection, right? Maybe with people she's just met, right? Like yeah. at the audience and people watching her. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up humor. Um, so some questions are coming in. Thank you for the beautiful film. How many years did you work on the film? We we don't want to think about that. No, um, a long time. It, it's probably well, we, five, the, five years. Five yeah. years, probably. Yeah. I mean, we are we're always doing more than one thing at a time. And when you're telling a story like this, you don't know where it's going to go or when it's going to go there. And we actually had been filming. You know, we between filming and editing, we had been working for you know three plus maybe four years, and felt like okay, this is long enough. We got to finish this film. And at that point, Renee was still living with Bev, and we just figured, okay, we have to somehow wrap it up, whatever. And then Bev called up one day, and she said, I don't know if you're interested in this for the film, but Renee's going to be moving out on her own. <laughs> you know, do you think, do you, might you want to film that? We were like, uh, yeah, yeah. I, that, that could yeah. be interesting. So the whole <laughs> kind of last 20 minutes of the film, uh, you know, arrived in year four and allowed us to finish the film and make it have a completely different meaning than it would have had right. before that happened. Um, I know when I initially communicated with you, you said that COVID had kind of um, detracted for your in, from your interactions with Renee, but we have an audience member wanting to know if you know how Renee is doing and do you have chances to keep in contact with Beverly and Renee? 
we we do and and we always keep in contact with any people we make films with because you become more you become friends over the course of doing something like this um and beverly and renee are both doing very well we just talked to bev and you know they things are things are really um moving along they got through covid beautifully beverly has moved to greensboro so she is now not in Raleigh anymore. She's close by Renee. So, and as Steve said, she's taking care of her father. But um, and you know, one of the ways that I've kept up with Renee over the years, is, you know, is her Facebook page, and she's always um, flagging when people have birthdays, and when she has birthdays, we're all writing in. And so, I mean, Facebook has been a good way for her to stay in touch with. I mean, she is such a community-focused person. Yeah. And she, you know, has these long lists of everyone's birthdays and who she loves and, you know, who's got cats. And, you know, so she's, uh, though I noticed recently that there weren't as many postings on her page. And I don't know if they've they've dialed back on that. But well, Bev often thought she was posting too, too much, too much yeah. and she posts in all caps. So Bev and yeah. I used to joke that she was e shouting at us. But um Anyway, but she, they are both doing well, and I think you said Bev has a big yeah, show. In Arizona coming up, a big retrospective, and they're going to show the film, and she said that the, <laughs> the museum has bought 100 potholders, which they will give out as part of the exhibit. This was one of the great things when the film came out, and all the t every place it was shown, including at HBO, is Renee came and sold potholders. <laughs> And people bought a lot of potholders, and she was thrilled. Yeah, but she kept jacking the prices right. up, of course, oh. which was you know yeah. hard. Yeah, she's a businesswoman. So there's a couple things that you said that struck me. Um, it really came. To, well, first of all, you talked about she was such a community person, and right in the very beginning of this documentary. Um, Beverly talks about how she, her life was so different from the life that her mother and Renee lived. And one of the things she mentioned was that she had purchased a car for them. And with that car, they did de deeds for people, all good deeds for people all the time. I thought that was a really nice, um, it's just a nice example for us. You know, um, I may have said this to you, but in December, I try to select programming that kind of is heartwarming and it reminds us of ways we can give back, et cetera. And so that was one message that I thought was beautiful. And then after she moved, Renee moves into her apartment, that beautiful housewarming party. Mm -hmm. It's so evident of how community helps people. Mm. Right. Forward. And, and the church service too. Right. The, and that whole discussion in the, the church. The whole church felt responsible. Yeah. Right. for this it's, it's not just renee's family so i wanted to point out you had asked me previously if there were classes coming and who might be in attendance so this is a shout out to instructor laura lamar who is here with her marital and family relations class and i think what a beautiful um connection I hope your students are writing down their, in their very second week of class that all sorts of topics and themes that you can discuss for the rest of the quarter. But um, what, what would you, Stephen and Jeannie, say about the family relationships, marital relationships, topics that are just sewn and woven throughout this entire documentary? Well, I think, you know, we were really kind of, um, <clears throat> you know, when we met Ethel, uh, Bev and Renee's mom, you know, this is a woman who was a single mother who worked as uh, taking care of people's houses, raising these kids, and what an incredible uh, sacrifice and you know effort she made to to do all of that um you know and that 
then, but she, the, the, a, a piece of that was also that she saw Renee in a certain way and what, had these assumptions about what Renee could do. And Bev had a different idea of what Renee's life could be like. And she was there to give her, you know, to take her from Ethel and give her that same kind of life. But at a certain point, she said, you know what? I think Renee can do more. Right. And that, you know, that's kind of the, the odyssey you see in the film where Renee actually loves living on her own and having her own place. She's still in the community and she's got relatives nearby. It's not that she's alone, but that amount of independence was something that Bev could see and her mom couldn't. I, I think that families, you know, should allow and do, in this case do, and probably many families dealing with these things, should allow the person to, to evolve and I, I think that Ethel couldn't do that because she was scared for Renee because bad things happened. And But it's it's interesting because um, one of the people who looked at this film and liked it a lot was Tom Har Senator Tom Harkin, who is from Iowa. I'm from Iowa, so and and he you know was was very much involved in the in the Americans with Disabilities uh, Act, and he said. This is such a great example. He said he was worried for the beginning of the film that Renee wasn't going to be given her head, like let Renee lead what she can do and what she would. And that it, by the end, he was like, OK, this is exactly what needs to happen is people have to react to how much the person they're with can do and really respond to it. Thank you. You you did a beautiful job of showing um, those pieces, and then the humanity that Beverly has to stay connected with a father that she never knew, and now you say she's um, caring for him. He's living with her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I know that in our audience, there's probably many people who can identify. Beverly's and Renee's out there, right? So it's really beautiful when you give us this opportunity to, to, to actually remember those that we've admired during our lives too. Um, another thing, and this would perhaps um, concur with Senator Harkin's thoughts, um, it's so easy for persons with disabilities to be discriminated against and you know shut them out of life think they can't do um for maybe loving reasons but also not loving reasons and um i i just think that the way you have shown renee helps us to see that in some ways her communication was more mature than many of ours um, it's direct in an in a beautiful way um and she had many powerful messages to teach the rest of us things that maybe we don't take time to consider. So I, I felt like that was coming through also. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you have any more questions, please send them through. Um, I, I would say that it was just heartbreaking to hear the story of the rape mm -hmm. accusation and then the actual occurrence um but also perhaps instructive to see how beverly has used that to help protect Renee in the future right yeah yeah i think that one of the things that beverly would say as a friend when we were talking is there were a lot of secrets that kind of is like peeling an onion, you know, that gradually she came to over the course of her life. And that one was late and she was actually quite surprised by that. But she said that the compartmentalization her mother did or the denial that her mother stayed in about the, the hard things in her life allowed her to be optimistic and a wonderful, cheerful woman. Um, so Bev didn't hold that against her that she didn't, wasn't out there with all the troubles. She really understood that that was the way she kept going. I think another thing about the film that's, you know, that, that we were just saying, we haven't seen it in a long time, so they, these things kind of pop out at you, but Beverly 
you know, we tend to think of if there's a disabled person in the family in some way that, you know, that it's a one way exchange or something. But Beverly gets so much from being around. And also she processes her life through her art. And Renee is such a central part of her work and the paintings that they've done. And Renee is so proud of being in those pictures and going to openings and um, being seen. You know, she's the opposite of being made invisible. She's seen and, and you know, Beverly's not somebody who sits around analyzing her work as much as just putting it on the canvas and letting yeah. you see it. And so, uh, you know, that, that last painting of Renee is, I find so powerful because there's so much emotion in her face and there, her eyes are different and so, one eye seems more wise and the other one seems maybe more distant and um you know that and beverly has captured that in, in her painting um yes so. i would agree yeah very very much so and uh, i was kicking myself as i watched the documentary because i could have done a little bit more to push our visual arts faculty, um, uh -huh. uh, you know, to connect with this. But we do have, uh, for anyone who is a Metro student, staff, or faculty member, our libraries have purchased a perpetual screening license. So this can right. be again, and we will um, continue that. So right, and I was I was going to say Bev is now um, a professor at Duke University, mm -hmm. and and um, I I think any art class would would be really thrilled to know about this because she is such a such a talented painter. It's it's amazing, and every people really recognize that. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have another question that has come in. Uh, I know this story was done in the South, but how is it possible that the KKK members were acquitted after shooting? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I just no. Um, as as you said at the beginning, I worked on uh, two episodes of <clears throat> Eyes on the Prize. And the history of people being acquitted is endless. Um, where they've been seen when it's known. Here they had footage. It, it just happens. And, uh, you know, it's a institutional problem in America. And I think we're all kind of talking about it more now than they, they maybe we were. But if you, if you want to look deeply into this, there are many, many examples exactly like that. And we just found that um, Emmett Till, who was killed, um, when he was 14, that the Justice Department still can't can't really say that those men that killed him admitted they killed him, killed him. It's there's yeah. a well. So, so this yeah. this that event is called the Greensboro Massacre, and you can look it up. And you know, nominally the reason they weren't is because it was a, a, a com it was a anti clan rally. The Communist Party was part of that. And then the Klan claimed that they were just, you know, reacting to that and that they had they were it was self defense or yes, something. Yes, yes, that one. Um, so that's 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 what the story was. But it, this has been a you know a, a huge event, and it had a whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission about it afterwards, and you know years later. Right. Um, yeah, it's just part of our history. These acquittals. Yeah. And what year was the Greensboro massacre? Do you recall? Oh gosh, I can't. That's okay. We can uh, all look yeah, it up. Yeah. yeah, we can all look it up. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that question came up because yeah. I thought it was very, very telling that uh, Beverly said when she returned to the South or when she'd go to Greensboro, she only needed to be in town for about an hour before she was reminded she was black. Right. And um, the segregation issues, uh, people commenting things to her that she found to be very different from her life in Arizona or maybe when she was working in New York. Yeah. Well, as she said, in when Arizona, 
there basically were no black people. <laughs> she was a, one of a great minority, and that's not, not true there. And by the way, Greensboro, I thought this was true. Greensboro massacre happened in 1978, which is actually later than people think those kinds of things happen. But, you know, they're, they're, they still happen, so... I would like to thank both of you very much and ask you if you have any final comments for our audience. No, I I'm, I don't. I, I hope people really enjoy it and see all of the dimensions of, of this film because there are lots of them. And, I, and watching it now, I, I am amazed by things I'd sort of forgotten. But I really want to thank you, Barbara, and, and uh, your, your college, your community college for for doing this program. And it's so great for, for people to be able yeah. to see Raising Renee we're, again. We're really thrilled. And also just to mention, our website is westcityfilms.com, W-E-S-T-C-I-T-Y-F-I-L-M-S. -E and if you go there, there's a page for Raising Renee. There's some more things written about it. Um, and you know you can get some more information about that and other other work that we do. You can also see uh, a link to uh, our a film we made called Troublesome Creek, which is about my parents' farm in Iowa. So that is is something that yes. I think people would be interested Shot in. Shot not that far from Omaha. Yep. <laughs> All right. So we yeah, we have some homework, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Great coming up, so you can spend some time taking care of that. Uh, 